Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our worship service at First Unitarian. Um, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the world we're living in right now and what has been on our TV screens and what many of us have experienced in person over the last few days. That is the the protests and the riots and the agitators and the police and the National Guard. Um, and I just want to address that with you very briefly before we begin our worship service this morning. We thought about changing everything uh, to address the current situation. And um, I decided that, uh, that our service will stand as it is. We could all use some church today. And the message uh, of this morning um, is relevant even with everything that is going on. Anyone who has uh, spent any time around First Unitarian Denver or knows our congregation knows precisely where we stand on the issue of whether or not Black Lives Matter. In fact, they do. And what they are telling us is that they cannot breathe. And I would just posit that all of us have that, um, are in that situation right now. We cannot breathe in the current conditions under which so many of our fellow citizens, black and brown, uh, are living in these times. So if you are going out to a protest today or at any time soon, please stay safe. Don't go alone. Let someone know where you're going. If you're not going to a protest, if you're just staying at home and watching it on TV, know that this community is with you. You're not alone. We are going to get through this. We're going to keep working for change. Um, we're going to stand with our brothers and sisters who are oppressed at this moment. And uh, that's all I have to say to you right now. Let's proceed with our worship and, um, and just, know that, uh, just know that you are not alone. Thanks. Good morning, First Unitarian. You know, one of the things Unitarian Universalist ministers have to do with some regularity uh, is explain Unitarian Universalism to people who uh, aren't familiar with it or haven't heard of it or, uh, or sometimes just don't understand it. This happens to me uh, pretty regularly. It happens in uh, interfaith gatherings. It happens on Sunday mornings in church. It happens on airplanes and sometimes standing in lines or uh, any place a stranger might happen to learn that I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. One of the things that confuses people the most um, is that we don't have a creed. We don't have a dogma, we don't have a doctrine, we don't have any kind of statement of uniform or expected belief. Because that's what religion is to most people, right? A, um, a group or a church or a denomination that gets centered around a particular theology, a particular statement about God or Jesus or the Bible, uh, and we don't do that, and hence the confused looks. So I have a number of ways I talk about this, depending on the context. And one of the, but one of the things I say uh, most often, or one of the ways I respond most often, is that our way of doing religion tries to be coherent with the world that we live in as we best understand it. Which is to say uh, that as science understands it, the entire universe from the most distant galaxy to the most subatomic particle, everything in between, every quark and atomic charge of it at every level is in flux, is constantly changing. Nothing anywhere at any level in the entire cosmos is entirely just static and fixed. So it just doesn't make sense to us to say that God is this, or Jesus is that, or the Bible is inher inerrant, or any other claim of absolute, unchanging truth, theological or otherwise. Such a belief would be the only thing in the entire universe, anywhere, any when, at any level, that would have that particular quality of being unchanging. I'm not saying there's no God or that Jesus is fake news. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying 
I'm just saying that the idea of an unchanging and unchangeable reality is a human construct that has no parallel anywhere in the universe as we understand it. So our whole soul living theme for the month of May is change. And the title I've given my comments today is Every Seven Years. That came from something I read not too long ago um, that said that every cell in the human body is replaced every seven years. And that struck me as kind of cool and poetic. Well, it turns out that's not really true. Uh, it turns out uh, there's a lot of variance in how this uh, whole birth and death of cells occurs. Uh, so, for instance, your taste buds and the linings of your stomach only last for a few days. Uh, skin cells and white blood cells last for a few weeks. Red blood cells last for a few months. Bones can be up to 10 years and so on and so on. Only, it turns out, the neurons in your brain and the lenses of your eyeballs stay with you from uh, when you're still in the womb until the day you die. And even those change their respective connectivity and their respective shape. I did learn though, I think this is even cooler, that on a molecular level, 98% of the atoms that make up your body change every year, every year. You and I are literally about as physically, chemically fluid as wind or the ocean, as fleeting as a thought, as fragile as justice. We just morph at a slower rate than wind or the ocean, which I also think is beautiful and poetic and profound. Buddhism has been teaching this basic truth for about 2,500 years. The Four Noble Truths as handed down uh, from the Buddha himself. The first noble truth is dukkha. That's the ubiquitous human feeling of there being kind of an underlying dissatisfaction. or something is missing or something is wrong or something is... Um, yeah, something's not quite right. Dukkha translates roughly but incompletely as suffering, but it also means uh, unrest, angst, ennui, emptiness. No one escapes that feeling entirely. The second noble truth says that these feelings of unease or dissatisfaction arise from desire. And my colleague, Reverend James Ford, a Unitarian Universalist Buddhist minister, wrote this, our experienced I, filled with hope and fear and most of all desire, clings to passing things as if each were ultimate reality. And as one thing after the other disintegrates, passes away or dies, the clinging ego is constantly bruised, hurt, crushed, or marked by anxiety. The third noble truth is the practical, compassionate answer to the first two truths. We overcome dukkha and desire by experiencing, by understanding, and most importantly, by internalizing the interdependence and the impermanence of all things. The uh, classic Buddhist sutra, the Avatamsaka, teaches that the entire universe depends on every single part of it, which is to say every person, every plant, every speck of dust is essential for the whole to exist. Even pain and death and cruelty and striving are necessary. Nothing can happen without everything present. That's how interdependent it all is. This is not an easy concept. And the fourth noble truth presents the vehicle, the path toward these realizations. It is the eightfold path. Man, you just got to love a spiritual tradition that gives you a numbering system to go by. The eightfold path consists of right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. In the Buddhist way, these are not progressive steps to be taken one 
after the other in sequence, but they are all mutually intertwined and must be approached or worked on simultaneously. Friends, we are living in a world where the winds of change are blowing hard. A few weeks ago, here on a Sunday morning, we observed that change is inevitable, but progress and sanity are optional, which is true. Change is happening, but positive change, progress, and sanity are going to require some faithful work from all of us. The winds of change are blowing, and maybe, this is my hope, Maybe this moment of upheaval can be capitalized into a movement towards sanity and progress in our world. What if this is all of this? What if this is an excellent time, maybe a perfect time, to be thinking about and working towards and shouting out about the kind of world we want to emerge from this chaos and all this mess, so that what emerges is a world where, for just an example, where an unarmed, handcuffed black man isn't murdered in broad daylight on a street by unaccountable police, or chased down and murdered while jogging, or choked to death on a sidewalk for selling cigarettes, or any number of other activities from which a white person would have simply been able to walk away. Maybe we can in help envision and emerge a world where the children of refugees aren't kept in cages while their parents are sent back to the certain death that they were fleeing from, where essential workers of our economy are respected and compensated, no matter their country of origin or their immigration status. Maybe we can help a world emerge where wealth travels in more than one direction, where opportunity is available to people in poor zip codes or where a decent health care where decent health care and a good education are considered fundamental rights of living in a democracy maybe we could even emerge a world where policy and decision makers have to pay attention to the actual science of climate change because we the people demand that they do for the sake of our children and their children and theirs. Wouldn't that be something? Here's what I know for sure. This transition I'm talking about, this change, this emergence of the world we live in into the world we might envision where some of those things are possible and even likely. That transition is first and foremost a spiritual transition of the human spirit, yours and mine. And over time, of course, it will need to involve economic, political, cultural, and systemic change, but I continue to believe that all of that work will be accomplished and sustained by people who have come to understand the interdependence, who are willing to be woke to the truth of the world we live in and all of its oppressions and brutishness, who are willing to grow in love and service, for whom compassion has become a way of life, a way of being, whose suffering yours and mine, whose suffering has become a source of strength and a vehicle for that passion. That's the other answer I give to this question of what is Unitarian Universalism and what do Unitarian Universalists believe? I tell people that we believe that the only true measure, the only litmus test, the only meaningful way to tell if your spiritual path is worthy and noble and worthwhile, is how much love and how much justice you are creating in your heart and in the world as you go. And I'll extend that. How much love and justice are we as a community creating 
in our hearts and in the world as we go. That's the way we tell. That's the measure. That's why I remain a Unitarian Universalist. That's the measure. And the rest, friends, is mystery. Amen. In just a moment, uh, you are invited to type into the chat box your own reflections or thoughts uh, on anything you've experienced today during this worship service or on the questions for wonder that will be shown on your screen in just a minute. What are you working to change in your life right now? And what are you clinging to? that will, in fact, someday be gone. I hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye.